For half a century, Toronto has been known as a city of neighborhoods. And now it's launching a program that will designate particular cultural districts in the 416. Little Jamaica and downtown's Chinatown have been identified as neighborhoods that could benefit from this program. With us now on how such designations might intersect with the city's diverse culture and identity. And as is our custom on this program, we're going to introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Mississauga, Ontario, with Chosen Wright, co-proprietor of Treasure Isle and a member of the Little Jamaica Ad Hoc Community Economic Empowerment Committee. And in the provincial capital in the East End, Mary McDonald, Senior Manager in Heritage Planning at the City of Toronto. In Kensington Market, Jay Pitter, Principal at Jay Pitter Placemaking and Planner in Residence at the University of Waterloo. And in the downtown core, Amy Go, President of the Chinese Canadian National Council for Social Justice. And it's great to have you four on our program tonight. Jay, start us off because I think we need to figure out what the mission is of this new City of Toronto program for cultural district designation. What's the mission? The mission is really to respond to local advocates in communities like Little Jamaica and Kensington Chinatown, where I live, as well as the Gay Village. Um, and the mission really is to bring together cultural planning tools with land use planning tools to ensure that the city is a good co-steward supporting local culture and disrupting displacement. And what does it actually mean in terms of the rubber hitting the road? Does this mean that local businesses or residents can go to the city and say, we want to be known as X, Y, and Z, now help us with that? Or what, what does it mean? So we're, we are co-creating what that means in real time. And so we know that there are some good practices. There's been tremendous research done. We're going out to speak to stakeholders right across the city from folks who work um, in professional land use planning and cultural uh, context to everyday people because we know that culture is boundless and it emanates from communities. And so we're shaping the program in real time with people who live across the city of Toronto. And one last follow up. Is Toronto sort of copying some other program like this that exists in other cities already? Well, Steve, you know I would never allow that. So, <laughs> no, we are not copying other cities because we are a distinct city ourselves. But we do see that there are some really progressive models. For instance, Minneapolis has a new cultural district model that is really meeting the moment by contending uh, with uh, displacement and centering equity. And so we are doing the same, but we're doing it in our own way, again, together with individuals living right across the city and bringing a vast number of city staff and city councillors together to co-create the program that is the right fit for our city. Shame on me for thinking for even half a second that anything Jay Pitter would be involved in could be copying anybody else and not a complete original. Shame on me. Sorry, Jay. <laughs> okay, thanks for that background. Mary, uh, let me get you into this now. I suspect there are people watching or listening to this right now who think, wait a second, this sounds a lot like, you know, the heritage designation programs that uh, that the province put in place many, many years ago that, you know, tell you what you can and can't do if you want to renovate properties or tear down properties or that kind of thing. Is this the same thing? No, it's, it's quite different. Uh, I mean, there is an aspect of heritage preservation or traditional conservation that might play into cultural districts. But what this program is doing, it's really responding to an important absence uh, in the provincial legislation around what we might call intangible heritage. So uh, it's very difficult to conserve culture, to conserve history. Uh, the legislation that is in place really puts an emphasis on buildings and landscapes and outdoors, uh, and you can't deal with uses. So it's, it's uh, legislation that's really insufficient for the kind of work uh, that Jay's describing. Now that's an expression I haven't heard before, intangible heritage. What do you think that means? Well, and you have a tangible heritage, which is what we're used to, which is the solid bricks and mortar, things you can touch and see. And then you have intangible heritage, and that might be cultural practices. Uh, it might be, uh, like culture is what people create. Culture is what, how people think about where they are. So 
you might give uh, a very special place in your, in your uh, history or in your personal experience to an area of the city, but it may not be represented by a building or a particular uh, or something that you could designate or put in place. So it, it can be spirituality. It, it's all kinds of things. Hmm. All right. May, let's I, get... may I build on Mary's Please. answer, Steve, just very quickly? Sure. Intangible cultural heritage really speaks to the daily rituals of everyday people, the stories that, divide, that define a place, um, the uh, spaces that are sacred sites that we can't see on the map, traditions and celebrations, and even sites of trauma within a community. So all of those things make up the very special, intangible cultural heritage of neighborhoods. And so we are responding to those things, recognizing that they are indeed as valuable and as important as um, tangible heritage. Understood. Chosen Wright, let me get you into this here because you're part of this little Jamaica ad hoc committee that's looking into being a part of this. Um, let me get your initial reaction to it. What do you think? Well, we like the idea. Um, going forward, um, the businesses on Eglinton would definitely love to see anything that's progressive. Uh, again, we may have reservations, but anything that sounds and looks progressive will have the attention of the majority of the people. Um, over the years, it's been difficult. Um, Metrolinx has been a major factor over the years, uh, as well as COVID, obviously. You know, us just coming out of uh, certain waves. So um, we want to see um, that uh, the preservation of our community. And, you know, and it's prior to COVID, it's been very difficult. We've seen uh, many empty storefronts. Um, and for us, we would like to know that Overall, businesses can still be there, thrive, and build where uh, the next generation can economically contribute to our city as well. Now, you said Metrolinx has been a factor in adversely affecting uh, Little Jamaica in the West End of Toronto. How so? Well, definitely uh, parking has been one of the major issues. Traffic is a, another major. Um, habits are formed over the years of avoiding Eglinton altogether. Um, driving through traffic is not something anyone wants to go um, and experience. So avoiding the, the, the that part of pocket of the city altogether has just been something that um, drivers have done over the years, and it's actually been seen now to affect business. Um, it's been 11 years of uh, construction, a long 11 years, and um, we'd like to see things progress. Uh, we'd like to see the customer base return. We'd like to see more foot traffic um, as other pockets of the city, you know, where you don't see this uh, major effect. So if you can get some kind of cultural designation that turns that around and gets people coming back into the neighborhood, you're for it. Definitely. Gotcha. Okay. Amy Go, let me get some feedback from you. What do you think of the idea? I think it's a good idea. Um, as Chinese Canadians, I think it's about time that the city recognizes not only our history, our identity, our development, but also more importantly, as, uh, as Jay said, the trauma and the racist context that we've been experiencing and still are experiencing in, in, in Canada and in Toronto as Chinese Canadians, as you know, illustrated during COVID. The, the rise of anti-Asian racism. So the, the destination to me, of course, is a ge geographical, you know, cultural district. However, I think it is that recognition and the impact as a whole on Chinese Canadian community and, uh, and recognizing that unique identity that we all share, that's more important. Yeah, could you follow up on that, um, Amy? The, the recognition, the recognition from whom of what? So, uh, unfortunately, we are still in a hierarchical society where power, you know, is rested in the in in, in dip, it not not shared equitably. So we are the as Chinese Canadians, we are marginalized in terms of our power. So that recognition that we are a community that has that unique identity and sharing of our experiences, our culture, and in the context of racist, racism by the white 
dominant community, <laughs> unfortunately, is still within, you know, held within the white, you know, community. That recognition is important. And by recognizing, we are hoping that it would then work towards, as Jay said, that um, just addressing the disparities and the inequities that we are experiencing. And so the community's development will be grounded and centered on the marginalized communities and bring about that equity and that sharing of benefits that we um, all Canadians are entitled to, particularly those that are right now not experiencing that kind of equitable sharing. All right, Jay, let me get you back you, in here. Time in. I'm sorry, does somebody else want to get in there? Yeah, I was going to say that I can agree where, where she's coming from. In fact, uh, we see a lot of displacements of some of our communities when it comes to even housing. Um, and, and in order to keep these communities the way they are as a community, housing is going to be a factor as well, too. They need places that are affordable, livable conditions. Um, and where we see places um, for my community of Eglinton West, um, Lawrence Heights has been one of the major communities that supports us. And we see the, the development over there over the years of um, high-rise condos um, right beside Yorkdale Mall, and where you see some displacement of our communities as well, too. So it is definitely a major factor. All right, Jay, let me get some better understanding from you as to how a neighborhood or a, a part of the city gets consideration. Because we've talked about Little Jamaica, the Chinatown that's downtown, Geary Avenue, which is in the west end of the city, Church and Wellesley, that's the gay neighborhood, the gay community, and probably, I guess, one other place in Etobicoke, North York, and Scarborough, the sort of the, the, the old members of the former city of Toronto, um, they're also going to be on the list. Tell me why those places in particular uh, are, are up for designation. So again, Steve, advocates from those particular neighborhoods, especially uh, Little Jamaica, the Gay Village, and Kensington Chinatown, have been in conversation with the city for several years. And so the city is responding to these communities. And in addition to redressing uh, spatialized discrimination, I just want to use an asset-based lens to talk about the opportunity that we have here. So as a placemaker, we're not just disrupting displacement. We're bringing together tools that help us to co-create communities where everyone belongs. And so that means looking at things like housing, having great amenity spaces for everyone, making sure that we have active transportation and connectivity, ensuring that we have spaces for festivities and celebration. So making sure that we're really honoring the people who've invested their lifeblood in these communities. And so as these communities have increased in value, that they get to stay in their communities to benefit from the value that they actually sowed in those neighborhoods, along with people from other cultures as well. Because what we understand is that as one of the most culturally diverse cities in the entire world, we don't have neighborhoods that only have one demographic. So as we're looking at this program, we're creating an opportunity to redress some spatialized harm, to also celebrate things that are wonderful about these places, and then also to create the conditions for cultural um, cultural harmony and also healthy and equitable cultural exchange. Well, you've just prompted a question that I want to put to Mary, uh, and that when you said not every neighborhood has a single identity, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, except that at some point, Mary, I mean, I'm, I've been around long enough to remember when the Danforth in Toronto uh, wasn't called Greektown. And then suddenly one day, everybody started calling it Greektown, because I guess there's a lot of Greek restaurants, a lot of Greek culture, a lot of Greek residents, and so on. How does something like that happen? How does all of a sudden a neighborhood become known by one ethnicity over all the rest? Well, it's, it's, uh, it happens in a few ways. I mean, the Danforth is a very interesting example, and it's, it's not unique in, in how our main streets uh, host immigrant communities. Uh, originally, at the turn of the century, the Danforth was Eng English, Irish, and Scottish 
neighborhood, uh, you know, people, the businesses. And then as there was a great building boom in the city and the brickworks were coming uh, uh, into the East End, you had waves of Italian immigration. You actually had more Italian businesses and, uh, uh, you know, f fruit and vegetable markets and cafes over time. It was always a mixed uh, immigration society, though. Uh, but in the late 60s, there was quite a wave of Greek immigrants who came uh, escaping political turmoil in Greece, and they became concentrated in, in that area and kind of took over a lot of the businesses that were associated with the Italian community, created uh, their own. And then it became known as Little Athens informally, and then Greek Town. A lot of the, the cultural kind of appellations we give in this city are largely through the business improvement associations. So there is something really importantly promotional about uh, promoting an identity, um, but it, that's very different than what we're looking at for cultural districts, which is a lot, a lot more nuanced, I think, has a lot more uh, understanding of the dynamics of culture. And Jay, are you satisfied that in doing this, in saying, in order to promote Greek culture in that part of the city, that's worth doing, and it has a better return for the people in the area than those who may feel, well, I'm not Greek, and I live in this neighborhood, and my ethnicity is not going up on a sign. You think on balance it works? So, you know, Steve, just to build on what Mary said, this isn't really about promotion. And cultural districts don't get um, known to be associated with one culture overnight. It's generally speaking a process that is tethered to arrival, tethered to the establishment of uh, small businesses, tethered to artistic expression, and tethered to mutual aid and community care networks. That's how cultural districts um, actually emerge over time, whether they are Greek or Jamaican or Italian. And so this program is following that comprehensive pattern that again emerges from up from the ground. And it is not about simple promotion. It is really about um, fostering culture, supporting culture, disrupting displacements um, as well. And so I just want to be so clear about that. It's not about promoting uh, one culture over another culture. It really is about using a rigorous, comprehensive, asset-based, equitable placemaking lens to ensure that these communities have dignified and beautiful housing, that they have a thriving uh, business network. We're also thinking about things like food security, leisure and play, um, intergenerational connections. And so we're using a very holistic, comprehensive lens that goes well beyond the language of promotion and well beyond sort of the BIA being uh, the central partner. I get Although you. the BIA is a partner, but there are many more components in this program. I get you. And I want to pick up on one word that you used in that answer, and that was displacement. And Sheldon, I'm going to call a bit of an audible here. Can we go to the bottom of page three? Because I want to talk about downtown Chinatown. And Amy, I'll get you in here for that. <clears throat> Not everybody's going to remember this, because you got to go back a bit. But the Chinatown, where it is today, wasn't always there, right? I mean, it used to be where New City Hall is. And then it, I guess it, it got displaced. And people moved further west to the Spadina and Dundas area. Can you take us through some of the history of that evolution? Absolutely. In fact, Chinese um, uh, Canadian community started with the arrival of Chinese wor railway workers. After the building of the railway, work railway, they were shunned by Canada. So some of them landed in Toronto. So they started around Union Station, around Adelaide, and continued to grow in spite of the attacks imposed on Chinese throughout 1885 to 1923. And then the community continued to grow and move north. And and where, where they actually um, moved into an area where the Jewish uh, immigrants were settling in the ward district of, uh, of the city, which is around Elizabeth and Dundas Street, where the city hall right now is. And so starting in the 50s, you know, city hall actually pushed the communities out of this area and move them west. And so the whole story of Chinatown and the development and the re displacement and the movement actually is a story about, you know, resilience, 
strength, community support, and community development. And so, you know, echoing what Jay said, it is that strong, that strength that that actually put the community through all the years of challenges from the time that Chinese landed, you know, in spite of all the hardships, including stripping them of license or attempting to strip them of their license to, to businesses, barring them from hiring white workers, you know, and all the limitations, including present day, you know, high scrutiny, uh, high scrutiny of the, uh, for example, the the massage parlors by the city licensing department, you know, all the targeted, you know, uh, I would call discriminatory actions. And of course, the, the, the support to the community by from, you know, the business all the way to, of course, the philanthropic side, the volunteer side, the nonprofit, the advocates and the artists and all everybody working together. So that is the story that we want to tell. That is the narrative of Canada and Toronto, of communities working together in spite of hardship in spite of racism. Well, let me that, do a fast... Isn't that a good story to tell? I was just going to say, Amy, that the, the attempts to discriminate and to keep the Chinese community down obviously didn't work because downtown Chinatown's phenomenal. And, I mean, it's only one of how many Chinatowns across Toronto? It's got to be four or five of them, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. Continue, you know, with the uh, Broadview, uh, Danf uh, Broadview Girard area, the, you know, Scarborough area, the Markham and, and Richmond Hill. And, and, and again, this is because the Chinese Canadian community continue to grow, right? Um, there are still newcomers and immigrants while coming from all over the world, uh, settling in different parts of Canada and, of course, the GTA. At the same time, of course, we also have the fourth, fifth generation Canadian. Canadians who have had long history, family history in Canada. So all these communities coming together wherever they are. But regardless, I think the story is the same. The, the, that strong identity and heritage and that strong of belonging is where we all want to strive for and all we want to achieve. All right, let's turn our lens to Chosen right now and talk about Little Jamaica. And to start with, Chosen, would you tell us a bit about your business, Treasure Isle? What do you guys do? Well, Treasure Isle was originally started as a music store. Um, it was started here by a Canadian uh, reggae artist by the name of Nana McLean. Uh, she was on a record label in Jamaica known as Treasure Isle, and she decided to open up the label here in Canada. Um, it started as a record store and evolved over the years. Uh, now we're a cultural hub for Jamaican, Caribbean, and African Um clientele where we sell natural health products as well as music um, and entertainment for the people of uh, Toronto. Now the answer to this is going to be obvious but I'm going to ask it anyway because that's what I do. I ask obvious questions. It's not spelled treasure T-R-E-A-S-U-R-E. -E. It's treasure T-R-E-A-J-A-H. How come? Well originally it was Treasure Isle um, that was the record label. Um, the second owner, uh, Natty B, actually had changed the name to Treja. Uh, it's a play on words, uh, Ja being a name of God for the Rastafarian community. So we treasure God. So it's a play on words. Fabulous. And Sheldon, I know you brought the picture up for a second. Bring it up again if you can, just so we can see. There it is right there on the right-hand side of the shot. That's the record store. And maybe just while you've got the floor here chosen, tell us a bit about the evolution of Little Jamaica, when it might have started, how it's evolved over the years. Uh, Little Jamaica has been around from the uh, early 70s. Um, there's been stores, uh, cultural hubs for uh, many years. A lot of immigrants from Jamaica come into Toronto, um, Eglinton being uh, that hub, a uh, place where you would actually come and uh, you can get uh, some good food. Uh, great music, um, you can get your hair cut, get your uh, hair supplies. Um, it's been like this for many years. Uh, the involvement over the years uh, contributed to uh, some of our biggest festivals in the city like Caravana um, and hosting um, many events uh, on Eglinton for our community and giving people access to just a little bit of taste of uh, Jamaica itself. It's actually known in Jamaica, a lot of Jamaicans uh, know about Little Jamaica here in Toronto. And in your estimation, based on your experience over the years, do you think Little Jamaica has its share 
of amenities and public services comparable to other neighborhoods? In my opinion, uh, we, we, we could use more. Um, I mean, we need to work more with the BIA. Uh, we need more access. And uh, I, my friend had mentioned this as well, again, with uh, the Asian community as well. Um, we need to, that identification. Uh, we need to, they need to know that we are here. Um, and, and that we need to thrive as well, too. Um, again, 11 years of Metrolink, we didn't, haven't seen much help. Um, COVID has actually been more help to our community than actually 11 years of Metrolink. So there's a lot of work to be done, um, uh, and we need to come to the table and come to these agreements together. So let's, Jay, do the specific question about this specific neighborhood. If it gets the cultural designation that we've been talking about, how would that help Little Jamaica be more than what it is now? So one of the um, important things that it will do is to not only acknowledge not only Jamaican culture, but Black culture and the way that it's shaped the neighborhood, it will acknowledge Black people with Black culture because we have a tendency to celebrate Black culture without celebrating Black people. The other thing that, you know, um, going back to your uh, question, Steve, uh, that you asked Chosen about amenities, we know that in a lot of neighborhoods like Little Jamaica, there is amenity inequity in terms of park space and uh, infrastructure that supports active transportation and um, those types of things. And so that's very important as well. Again, using not only a cultural lens, but a place-based lens and a placemaking lens as well. And we know that when we are talking about um, contributing and uh, co-developing better amenities in communities, when you use a place-based approach, um, what happens is that everybody in the neighborhood benefits, right? Like having new parks and new green spaces and wider streets and um, safe streets, these kinds of things benefit absolutely everyone uh, in a particular planning area. And so that's really important. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that now, we also have to recognize indigeneity in this work. So as we're talking about, you know, honoring and celebrating, uh, you know, new arrivals and settlers and to be clear, uh, you know, people who are of African descent um, are not settlers in the same way um, as other individuals who've settled here, because many of us are descended of people who came here not by free will and who were brought here in shackles. But nonetheless, it's critically important to ensure that this process also really recognizes and honors Indigenous peoples and Indigenous places as well. And so if we get Little Jamaica right, what we'll be doing is centering the contributions of Black community members and other equity-deserving uh, groups, such as unhoused people, other racialized groups, Indigenous peoples, mothers, children, our elders. And so this is a great strategy for absolutely everyone. And Mary, just in our last minute here, maybe you could put a bow on this, is the, is the thinking here that if various neighborhoods get this cultural designation, it will give them at City Hall, I don't know what, a better claim to some of those amenities that Jay and Chosen just listed. Is that part of the thinking here? Yeah, part of the thinking would be where, if you understand what communities need, uh, and as you are planning for them and as change is rapidly happening in this city, you can see those opportunities and you can ensure that you're listening to what communities believe they need, not what, uh, what City Hall thinks people should have. And uh, that will help to sustain those communities. You know, one thing that's really interesting about what is happening in this conversation is we are talking about groups who have been marginalized, who have been pushed off land, who have been moved away and moved out. Uh, and what a cultural district can potentially do is to keep those roots in the ground. Gotcha. Yes. And want... Mary, you know, in addition to what Mary said, again, I want to really use an asset-based lens here. It's not just about need. It's about community strength, community power, and community magic. 
And that's really important as well to use an asset based lens to understand that this is not strictly about addressing need because this is not going to be a stigmatized program. This is recognizing contributions and power. We're all about the magic here, Jay. We love to hear that. Uh, let me just do one last thing before we leave and answer the burning question that so many of our viewers now have. Yes, Amy Go and Avi Go, who's been a guest on this program many times, yes, they are sisters. For the record, we just thought we'd say that. Thanks, you four. We appreciate you being on our program tonight. Take good care. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Bye. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.